I am trying to get everyone to use the hashtag, hashtag 10 steps and the stigma because all too often, well-meaning parents come in with suicidal teens and tell these teens, just don't tell the school or your friends or grandma. And so now we've got shame because we've got a secret. And if the kids break that silence, then we've got guilt. And at the very least, we're encouraging isolation from people who could support them. I grew up with that secret shame, guilt, and isolation. And I'm not doing that anymore, which is why I go on podcasts and talk about this openly. And yes, someday my parents will find out and probably... uh, lose their shit, but I don't care because they had their chance to fix it. And so now I'm trying to fix someone else, just one person. ADHD Rewired, episode 315. This is the podcast for those of us with really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. I'm Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker by training and a coach by design. I'm your host and I have ADHD. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community. We are wired for connection and you are not alone. Go to ADHDrewired.com to learn how you can join us in our free secret Facebook group. Get additional resources for every episode, including links to any resources we we mentioned on today's show. You can support us on Patreon, sign up for our email newsletter, you can request podcast postcards to distribute to your clients and support groups, and you can learn all about our intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups. You can do all of this at our website, ADHDrewired.com. We know that starting is the hardest part, so let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. Today's guest is Lindsay Wisner. Lindsay is a clinical psychologist in Long Island, New York. She graduated from Georgetown University in 1999. That was a very good year. That's when I graduated (laughs) from high school and was awarded a fellowship in child development at NIH, National Institute of Health, and the NICHD, which is the National Institute of Coloring. Child and, child, child and Family Development. You're not editing that out. That was great. <laughs> Wait, HD, I think you see, I think you have a typo. National Institute of Child and Family Health Division. I swear I don't. They have a typo. <laughs> she received her doctorate from CW. Post L I U. I don't even know what I just read. It doesn't matter. Okay. And went on to pursue a postdoctorate training at the American Institute of Psychoanalysis. So she's a smarty. Dr. You could have just said that. Yeah, that would have been easier. But Dr. Wisner is the current host of the Neurotic Nourishment podcast. Now, keep listening to this one before you go subscribe to that one. I know the name sounds appealing. Oh, if you want to pause, just make sure you come back, but write it down so you remember to come back. And the co-host of the upcoming book, co- not co-host, I made that up, co-author of the upcoming <laughs> book, uh, 10 Steps to Finding Happy. Uh, this book will be released on March 20th, 2020, in accordance with the United Nations International Day of Happiness. Lindsay, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for having me and for that extremely wonderful introduction. It's one of my best yet. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure. No, you got to save it for posterity. I, I, uh, we stumble through stuff here and, uh, we leave it in because, um, yeah, because, uh, you know, the, the mistakes that I, you know, it's, I think the only thing I really edit out are, um, I don't know, weird noises that might be offensive to those listeners who have, um, misophonia. Um, so I'm not going to chew in your ear. Um, at least I won't try to, um, because that's a that's a real thing, misophonia, which I'm well aware. <laughs> um, and you know what Batman says? Why do we fall down so we can get back up? So stumbles are good. I like that. I know that was my ADHD and the fact that my whole family are superhero dorks. So and so you are medicated today. <laughs> <laughs> but perhaps not enough. I don't know. I am medicated today, but I, my creativity does not end at my medication. So, all right. So you are you're a shrink, uh huh, and a author, mm-hmm. a relatively new ish podcaster. But you have like fifty some episodes. Yeah, we're on season two, and whatever thirty two plus 
nine is. So I think 41. Yeah, that was some good mathing. <laughs> uh, and you were diagnosed with ADHD uh, about eight months ago after you were being told that you weren't living up to your full potential. Right. Well, um, I spent all, uh, first of all, I failed fourth grade math. I'm pretty sure my mother, like, I don't know, pulled some strings to get me to move on. It was that long division it requires a lot of attention. Oh, God. Right? <laughs> long division. <laughs> and I use it so much every day now. So, mm-hmm. you know, um, yeah. And then that was like, I always did well, well enough. Um, I went to a very good private school in Florida. I, um, I ended up going to, uh, Georgetown. I was never the smartest. I always had to work my butt off in ways that no one else understood. Like, um, I had to study by retyping and or rewriting my notes. Um, I constantly had to do this active learning that didn't seem weird to anyone because, uh, well, I'm a woman. I'm not hyperactive. I was born 10 years too soon. And so no one was looking for, um, that, uh, ADD versus ADHD. I know where it's all the same, but whatever. Um, but no one was looking for that distractibility. You know, I, I remember being in like third grade and putting glue on my hands and then peeling it off. And I knew exactly what the teacher was saying, but I needed something to occupy the other part of my brain. (laughs) It's amazing how many visceral responses I've already had listening to you talking first about long division and then, and then the glue on the hand, peeling it off when you get like the full peel where it doesn't like, it doesn't break off. It's so satisfying. And you see the ridges of your skin like that. Yeah. And that was how I spent like third and fourth grade, which is not a surprise that people thought I wasn't living up to my full potential. Uh, I did well. I just didn't do that well. And then I, you know, but no one was looking for it. Like maybe I was lazy. Maybe I just wasn't as smart as, you know, my parents or I thought I was, but um, I have an 11 year old. And when He started sixth grade this year. We have known, my husband is a shrink also, and we have known since he was like three, four, five, that this was going, this was his plot in life. And of course, it never occurred to us that it came from one of us. We just figured, well, okay, you know, first kid, we fucked him up somehow. And, um... I like I can, what are you you can you can interrupt me. <laughs> uh, I'm say I, I am a firm believer in that the uh, the goal of parenting is just to minimize how much we pick up our kids. Oh damn it! I thought we were going to be soulmates. I thought you were going to say my goal is to fuck my kids up differently than my parents fucked up my me. I mean, I'm sure that will also occur. Do you not have kids? Oh, I have one. Okay. Mm-hmm. How old? He's eight. Oh, so you've already fucked him up in some way. Yeah, and he's uh, got my a lot of my genes as well. He's uh, he's not in the middle of that neurological bell curve by uh, any <laughs> sense of the imagination. Um, he's uh, he's highly gifted. He's uh, got ADHD and he's on the autism and spectrum. That, right, and that's my 11-year-old. Ah. He is, you know, they call it double, double twice, gifted. Twice exceptional. Twice exceptional, thank you. I am literally the representative at his school for the special ed PTA, so I should know that, but... I don't. Uh, But so we've known since he was like six and I told him eight times to get dressed. And I walked into his bedroom and found him with one shoe, one sock, underwear, a shirt and building this amazing thing with Legos. And I was like, yeah, we're going to have to do something about this before high school. And then they decided in fifth grade, they were going to start switching classes to prepare them for sixth grade where they switch classes to prepare them for high school, where they switch classes. And this kid lost his mind. And at one point, you know, towards the end of the year, I decided, let me get him. He had a 504. I was like, let me get him an IEP because I realized how much he needs. And so um, I had him tested and he was tested by his psychologist who he had been seeing for depression for about a year. And he, (laughs) she calls me, she goes, we've got some problems. And I'm like, okay. And I come in and she's like, the good news is he's off the charts, ADHD, like off the charts. I was like, oh, okay, sure. The bad news is he's super anxious and super depressed. And why is he super anxious and super depressed? Because as hard as he tries, it's not enough. Yeah. Mm. 
So yep. we filled out the parent forms. I took him to this. I took him to a uh, psychiatrist. I got him started on antidepressants, which I am a fan of uh, for children and adults. Um, and I also, he started uh, Vivance, my personal favorite. And I watched him change to a completely different person who makes the coolest things in the world and has like a swagger that he didn't have before. Like, He's still kind of lousy with girls, but he's getting better. And, you know. (laughs) You said he's 11. uh, Yeah, he's 11. He's supposed to be lousy with girls. I know, I know. But like, you know, (laughs) but fine. Um, And then as I was filling out his forms, I was like, huh, this reminds me of me. And then as the responsible licensed New York clinician I am, I stole one of his Vyvanse one day to try it out. And I was like holy shit balls this is amazing so i set up a an appointment with a neurologist who i know and love and admitted to him that i did this um he probably didn't put that in the notes but whatever and i don't recommend it for others but i'm a doctor so whatever (laughs) um so uh you know i I filled out as um, he's asking me questions and he goes so when you were in you know do you procrastinate enough a lot rather do you procrastinate a lot I said never he goes never he's like well what about when you were you know in school in grad school because you know here I am I've got this school like I'm 42 years old you know and um I said no 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 I couldn't procrastinate um he said what do you mean you couldn't and I said well uh, you know I can only pay attention to something for so long so if I procrastinate I'll never learn the material and oh Oh, and suddenly he and I had this like click moment and, you know, um, so it took you 10 hours to do the things that take other people one pretty much. And the birds started tweeting and like, it would have been a love moment, but you know, I'm married with two kids and it's enough to deal with one man, never mind two. But, uh, I was very grateful for this moment. And then he, he, you know, gave me a prescription. (laughs) Like we worked that out pretty quickly. Um, and then before I left, he get, he had me fill out this Jasper Goldberg form, which is an ADHD assessment form. You could look it up online if you have any doubts and you want to know just how severe you are. But humorously, uh, his receptionist actually gave me the wrong form. So she gave me this form. It's for uh, brain damage. And one of the things you do is you have to do you know what I'm talking about. You have to draw a clock. And they want you to draw all the numbers on the clock. Right. And it's, just, it's to see if you have like hemispatial neglect, yes. if you can only see one side of it. And I was for a minute freaking out. I was like, what the fuck does he think is wrong with me? And then I was like, slow, slow down, Lindsay. And I, and I said, um, you you gave me the wrong form. No, I didn't. That's what he wants you to have. I was like, well, you know, uh, uh, ADHD <laughs> used to be called minimal brain dysfunction. Really? Mm-hmm. Well, I. I, it's not hemispatial neglect though, but I did not know that. That's really interesting and frightening and awful. But um, so I finally conv- begrudgingly convinced this very curmudgeonly woman to um, to double check, at which point I got the correct one. And obviously I can add, and I've seen, you know, forms like this. So by the time I left, I knew that I was like top, 10 percent of adhd and i was pretty proud of myself for my uh diagnosis and only taking 42 years to get help you know it's so it, i was curious what is your what was your like personal story about like here you are as a psychiatrist who, psychologist okay oh so you're a okay you're a psychologist okay we have to cancel this podcast now because I, I thought for the last few minutes that you were a psychiatrist even though your bio clearly said psychologist just. We don't have to cancel this podcast. You didn't say anything until that moment. No, I love this podcast. <laughs> Just the story in my head, like you were a psychiatrist. And I, so I was like wondering, can you write your own like, you know, prescriptions? But then you're not a psychiatrist. And so now you can't write your own prescriptions. No, and I should never be. No, oh, actually, you can't write your own prescriptions anyway, nor can you write for your family members, family members anything that is a C4 drug. Like nothing fun can you write. Like my dad can call me in my... um Selexus and Balto, whatever the fuck I take, but he can't call me in my uh, Vyvanse or Clonopin or heroin. Should that become on the market? You know. <laughs> oh boy. Okay. This is, a, is that a good time to um, uh, needle in a break? 
Yeah, sure. Needle in a break. You see, I told you I would, I would do some really like attempt to make a good like segue transition. That's it, fine it because my just... next my next joke was going to be that had I ever tried coke or crack, I probably would have realized earlier that I was a ADHD. So yeah, I think this is a good break time. <laughs> and we will be right back on this week's episode of hacking your ADHD. Will Curb is uh, discussing fear and loathing with ADHD. Check out Hacking Your ADHD with Will Curb this weekend every Monday. Join Will as he explores ways that you can work with your ADHD brain to do more of the things you want to do. Subscribe to these short, mindful ways to hack your ADHD. Check out this week's new episode, Fear and Loathing with ADHD. Go to HackingYourADHD.com for show notes and to easily subscribe. And every Friday, check out ADHD Essentials with Brendan Mahan. Brendan's guests include parents, educators, and experts focused on children with ADHD. And right now, if you are a parent and you are in the new world of homeschooling your kids, you can probably use a little extra support tips and guidance. And uh, and Brendan's actually been doing a really uh, lovely job talking about just kind of coping with, with COVID-19 and uh, things around that. So... Check out his podcast and his website, ADHDessentials.com. Both Hacking Your ADHD and ADHD Essentials are both part of the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. Both podcasts are available to everyone, everywhere you consume podcasts. Join me and the host of ADHD Essentials, Brendan Mahan, and the host of Hacking Your ADHD, Will Curb, every second Tuesday of the month at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1.30 p.m. Eastern, for an hour of live Q&A. Register for free at ADHDessentials.com slash events. That's ADHDessentials.com slash events. Our next live Q&A is Tuesday, April 14th at 1.30 p.m. Eastern. Don't be late. Or if you are, it's fine. We'll see you there. ADHD Rewired just hit its six year anniversary of podcasting. And because ADHD Rewired is a more than just a podcast, it is a community. I want to invite you to be a part of a special six year anniversary episode. Yes, technically the six year anniversary already passed. But it wouldn't be an ADHD podcast if we did it on time. So come hang out with the other listeners and community members and share with us how ADHD Rewired has helped you. This is an opportunity for you to share your story on the podcast. We are doing it April 1st at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. To find out how you can join us on Zoom for this special event, go to ADHDrewired.com slash events. That's ADHDrewired.com slash events. And while you're there, you can sign up for our monthly live Q&As that we do every second Tuesday of the month. That's ADHDrewired.com slash events. Look forward to seeing you there. And we are back. All right. So uh, let's dive in to um, your book and uh, 10 steps to finding happy. What tell us the, your journey here? Cause I think it's um, one of the things that I find uh, really um, fascinating is sort of the dichotomy between the topic that this book was sort of stems from and just your personality. Yeah. And and also what I want to use this book to raise awareness of. I hope, yeah. Okay, good. Um, so I have never read a self-help book in my life. I, um, for no logical reason, disapprove of vision boards just because it can't be that simple. I'm willing to burn sage if someone gets it to me and guarantees my fire alarms won't go off. I love yoga. It's the only way my brain will shut down for meditation because yoga is an act of meditation. Um, but never imagine that I would write a self-help book. My book is called 10 Steps to Finding Happy. And essentially, I fell into it much the same way I fell into my specialty of working with um, suicidal teens by total accident. If anyone ever does like a memoir, autobiography, biography of my life, it should be like, whoops. You know, I slept and there I was. So, um, just in case I forget to uh, record something at the beginning of the uh, this episode, trigger warning, which I have like mixed the eating 
feelings about the ideas of trigger warnings, but we're going to be talking about suicide. So if uh, that's something that is like, maybe you're at a state where you don't know if you can, if that's going to be hard for you, um, you might want to just uh, skip the rest of the episode. So, but I want to encourage you to be courageous and listen. I have mixed feelings about trigger warnings Me too. because um, a trigger is our body tell- or brain telling us that we need to do something. Yes. And we need to pay attention and that we have an unresolved broken yes. in us. And so um, I res- it's your pod and I respect you and I respect your listeners, but just as a shrink, uh, triggers shouldn't be in my mind avoided depending on how close in time and place and proximity and severity. In fact, I think that the way we um, get rid of phobias is a gradual exposure. Mm -hmm. And I sort of feel like we should deal with triggers the same way. Maybe we need need to rebrand trigger warning, like therapy warning or therapy. Careful. You might work towards getting a little bit more over something that has pained you for years. Um, and I'm not trying to minimize that, although I know my voice sounds a little lighthearted. But um, so just to go back to something hopefully non triggery, um, in 2014, I won the first ever Cosmopolitan Fiction Contest. My joke is. I probably broke it because it was also the last. Um, And I won it for an excerpt from a book that did not mention a blowjob. So I'm very proud of that win. Um, Thank you. Uh, They told me they were going to tweet it at me. And I was like, I don't know how old I was, but I had two little kids. I was pushing a double stroller, didn't have a clue what a tweet was. Handed my phone to the youngest kid working in the bagel store was like, I need a Twitter account now. And so um, he after they like all these really cool authors, like big name authors, like who were involved in the judging process that I didn't know. They all wrote, yay, congrats. This was our favorite. Who knows if it was? I don't care. I love them anyway. Um, I figured out what hashtags were. And so I started following certain, you know, local writers on hashtags. And I met this woman, Selene Castrovia who was my co-author and um, we would sort of workshop each other's stuff. She lives 15 minutes away from me. Our, my son and her niece are the same age and in the same school. And so we would, uh, you know, we became friends and two years ago I was about to turn 40. So I decided, you know what I should do? I should learn to surf because What 40-year-old with back issues shouldn't learn to surf? (laughs) It went as well as you would expect. And I threw out my back. I spent about a month in bed, which was kind of relaxing because I have children. And at one point, Selene sent me her manuscript and said, a lot of people have been telling me for years I should write a self-help book. I don't know why anyone would tell her that, but they have been and supposedly, and she wanted me to take a look and I read it and it was a teensy bit high on painkillers, much needed painkillers, not abusive painkillers. And I realized that everything that she said could be backed up by actual science research, uh, et cetera. And I am a huge science research dork. I love incorporating it into daily life. I love taking apart what your scary evening news announces as facts and explaining that those aren't facts. Those are relationships that are barely related that someone decided we should scare the crap out of everyone with. So when I realized that her 10 steps, such as like decide to be happy or try something new or um, uh, get rid of the clutter in your life, both people and possessions could all not Marie Kondo, don't go there, but could all be backed up with actual science. I asked her if I could be her co-author. And so uh, two years ago, we started working on this and it was very interesting. I also recruited 24 expert writers in various fields to sort of add on to our points with personal experiences or whatever, you know, whatever their, um, specialty was meditation mindfulness art therapy etc and we came up with a pretty good book um and i've actually had three people tell me that the book has changed their life Mm. which is not as good of a book as i thought we had written but 
my goal has always been if it helps one person, I'm in. So two years ago, we started the book. There's many edits and, um, you know, different versions and layouts and all of this. Don't write a book unless you really want to isolate all your friends and family for like years. Um, and then, and this is where your trigger warning that I vote to untrigger, but whatnot comes in, uh, 12, 14 months ago, the teenagers in my small town and surrounding towns of Long Island started killing themselves. And I had a very triggering, as you would call it, reaction because I grew up with a parent um, they don't listen to podcasts, so it doesn't matter. Uh, my mother has attempted to kill herself no less than nine times. And the first time I found out about it, I was, it was summer after my freshman year of college and she and I were in some fight over something stupid as happens when, you know, it's a normal part of the growth process in adolescence. And then when you come home from college and so, we were in a fight over something stupid and my mother s screamed at me that I was upsetting her so much. She had tried to kill herself and it was my fault. How did you respond to that? Um, I think I just cried because uh, the intellectual part of me knew it was fucking crazy. And then the other part of me knew that this was a real thing that she had just a real cat that had just been let out of the bag. I didn't know there would be nine cats let out of the bag. Um, I didn't get a lot of answers to my questions when I asked her or my father. He sort of brushed it under the table. He's a physician, by the way. Um, but he sort of brushed it under the table. And then my brother, who is four years younger than me, four years later, the exact same scenario repeated itself with him and her yelling that giving him the same information. Uh, at that point, I started talking to my brother and told him that I had been through the same thing. And for a while, it was a really weird summer where like we were afraid to walk into the bathroom to find her with slit wrists or if we called out her name and she didn't come or if she was sleeping in bed um, and we went to, you know, wake her up if she didn't make up immediately. It was this very scary time um and there would be many more scary times and many worse times how old were you again when this started i was 18 about to turn 19 okay so you hadn't had your kind of schooling yet that would okay no i hadn't um but i had grown up knowing that my mother had a substance abuse problem um, what I didn't know then was definitely some mental illness issues. Uh, sometimes the fun mom is fun because she's fucking crazy. And it just took me a while to put those. It took me like grad school to put those pieces together. Um, and then when we, when I was in eighth grade, so when I was 13, she, was in a severe car accident and doesn't wear her seatbelt because she's a badass and still continues to refuse to wear her seatbelt. Um, and went through the windshield, refused medical attention, uh, had TBI, traumatic brain injury that was never treated, and then proceeded to spend the next two years in and out of hospitals and surgeries dealing with the results, uh, you know, the backlash of the accident for which she she left the hospital because I'm a doctor's wife. I don't have to stay. <laughs> There's a little bit of narcissism there too. Mm. So how, how uh, your, so your brother had sort of experienced that same thing that you had experienced years later. Did you ever share with your brother? Um, yes, when that, under that night, that okay. night, that okay. very night. And then, um, uh, my brother got it a lot worse in some ways because I, was already, you know, I was in eighth grade when she had the accident. He was in fourth. Um, I remember getting a call at college that my, from my father, that my mother had pulled a knife on my brother. And somehow I was supposed to stop this. 
So. Oh, man. No wonder why you became a therapist. No shit. It was very weird. Um, Wow. And so um, at some, but so I, I, you know, I went on to graduate school. There were many more suicide attempts. If you don't hear from my parents for a few weeks, you know, she's in a hospital somewhere. Uh, Some were slightly comical, like when she slit her wrist and was being taken out on a stretcher and started yelling to the policeman that she didn't do this. My father did this because, you know, unless you're ambidextrous, you really can't slit both wrists. Um, There was the time she drove into a liquor store. um, Like drove into it? Yeah, but they're metal in Florida because we're like, Florida is the ghetto of the world, let's be honest. So um, she didn't get very far, but like. There was someone locally who drove into a bagel shop. Were they old, though? They were on their phone and they thought their car was parked, apparently. Mm, I think they were high then, because that doesn't make any <laughs> sense. Um, mine was even, this was even more confusing, because like my mom drove a Jaguar at the time, and it beeps when you get too close to an object, like absurdly beeps. And so somehow she drove into a liquor store. But the liquor store was open at 10 a.m. and she and she bought tequila. So I feel like they sort of deserved it. But, you know, metal didn't go anywhere. Hmm. Okay. So this happened when in your sort of late teens, early twenties, and then, um, in your community, um, there was a, a slew of suicides. I couldn't think of the word. That's a good one. Slew. It's okay. I was waiting for you to pause me for a break. So, um, checking time. That's now is the time to take break man my my my, my say was you're getting like i gotta i gotta go to stayaway school or something too you can edit that no out i'm not gonna now. edit that that takes more time i'd rather just talk about how bad my sideways are and then that just okay. leave it in so or um, we could talk about how smart i am in reminding you of your segues <laughs> <laughs> is um is is narcissism running families I, let's take a quick break <laughs> <laughs> like asshole probably uh, does actually. we'll be right back Our spring coaching groups are just around the corner. And while we are full, we are gathering a wait list. So if you are interested in getting on the wait list for our spring sessions, which begin on April 8th, go to coachingrewired.com. It's also where you can sign up to get notified for our summer sessions. Also on April 1st, we are having a very special six year anniversary uh, event where we are inviting you to be a part of an episode. Uh, we did this on the 50th and 100th episode of the podcast and we are doing it again, uh, celebrating our six year anniversary, celebrating I get it a bit late. Wouldn't be an ADHD podcast if we, uh, I guess, did it on time. So come and be a part of the community. I know right now uh, there's really never been a better time where uh, we could reach out virtually because we are all practicing social distancing and uh, connection is so, so important right now. So I hope you can join us uh, for that. We are going to be doing it on April 1st at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. This is an opportunity for you to share some of your story on the podcast or share how uh, the podcast maybe has helped you uh, in your ADHD journey. To register for that, go to ADHDrewired.com slash events. That's ADHDrewired.com slash events. Support for this podcast comes from all of our patrons over at patreon.com slash ADHD Rewired. I appreciate all of the patrons who help make this podcast possible with your monthly contributions. I want to thank our five new patrons, Marie R., Matthew P., Jennifer K., Audrey H., and Ben W., All of you can view the March Q&A right now on the Patreon page and you can view it and other extra content for just $5 a month. For those of you who can give at the $25 a month level, Matthew P, you are a part of that group. You can join our monthly coaching call. Our next one is going to be on Tuesday, April 28th at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. So mark your calendars. To become a patron, go to ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. That's ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. Patreon is P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And thanks. And we're back. <laughs> and we're 
I'm back with this cheery topic. So yes, um, it got worse as I got older and what, especially, but I spent most of my or life. Just, just remind people because they were just listening to it. You think ad. they forgot that I was talking about my mother driving into a liquor store? Now they remember. Okay. Carry my on. mother drove into it. Um, uh, and there were, the problem is my mother is white, educated, wealthy. Um, so nobody and- talks about it. No one talks about it. And there's no consequences for her actions. She doesn't work. She doesn't need money. She doesn't, you know, um, my father is a doctor and she's very convincing. And it's she's always the victim. She's definitely a narcissist. She's always the victim. At this point, she's also been drinking for so long that she has what are called confabulations, where um, she really believes that things happened in the past that didn't happen in the past and she can justify her actions by these things um one time thanksgivings have always been fun one time she threw a glass of vodka at me and claimed it was because i was making fun of her um she also claims that her brother punched her at what's it called before a wedding at the rehearsal dinner of a family relative's um, wedding, which let me assure you, if if her brother punched her, she would have told the world about it, but that didn't come up until two or three weeks later. Um, and so all this time I have been, since 2005, I have been a psychologist and I have worked mostly with anxiety and housewives and um, couples, you know, interpersonal relationship problems, it never, ever, ever occurred to me to work with a suicidal population because of my own experience. And then um, two things happen. One is, again, January of 2019, the teens started killing themselves in rapid succession, ba- you know, based mm. on the size of our town and surrounding towns. There were two in January. I believe there was one in March. Um, and then there was a homicide in April, which was slightly different, but kind of related because it's the value of life. And then in September, there was a 15 year old child in my community that killed himself in, on, in the second week of school. Mm. So, um, he was, that was, uh, crushing. Meanwhile, uh, my mother disappeared for the month of August and I couldn't find her. And uh, fortunately, my parents have a live-in housekeeper who is sworn to secrecy, except when she knows that it's time to break it. And it turned out my mother had been found unresponsive on two occasions. Um, Somehow, This woman has alcohol hidden all over the house. I think she managed to almost overdose on Benadryl or she was like cheeking her nightly medication that she gets... um, from because she is still on painkillers from a back accident from 1989 right. 94 I can't math and um also she needs Xanax or Valium to sleep and unfortunately no one has put a stop to this so the second time she was found unresponsive myself my sister-in-law and my aunt, because my brother no longer participates in these interventions because he's it's, we've done too many. Mm -hmm. We convinced my father to, um, to start the pro the procedure for what's in Florida called the Marchman act. It's actually a great act. They don't have it in many States. We should. And what it is, is we pretty much, we all have a 72 hour hold act. It's called, the Irwin Act in D.C., because that's when I first heard of it. I unfortunately have no idea what it's called here, but it's basically 24 to 72 hour hold to assess for safety. Uh, make sure you're not going to hurt yourself or others. And then, it, you know, you have to be released by a doctor. So my. Uh, but so it's the Marshman mandatory Act, hospitalization. Yes. Unfortunately, in uh, poor areas of D.C., neighbors who are pissed off at other neighbors used to use it. To, um, like you're playing your music too loud. She threat, you know. So uh, it is awful in some places. And yet I that was 15 years ago that I worked with 
uh, attorneys to help with that. And so I hope that it has come far since then. But um, the Marshman Act is, it's a, a rather long process. It's not intended to be, but it's the government. So everything takes a long time. And what it is, is you, it's essentially for people who are on welfare or for wealthy housewives or trust fund babies. And I say this because the consequence of losing your job or not going to work or, you know, not taking care of yourself properly is none for both sides of this, you know, spectrum slash bell curve. So it allows loved ones, or I'm sure perhaps the government sometimes, but in this case, it was, uh, we, after we've been talking about doing this for five years and my father was finally convinced to file the papers and she was held against her will. And she was forced to sober up in a you know sober treatment facility and while awaiting trial which the trial is the key thing two things happened one there was a hurricane and so her trial got delayed and then two there was oh she ran into the streets <laughs> Well, she tried to commit suicide, sort of, or like the chicken that crossed the road tried to get to the other side. We're still not quite sure because there was a hospital on the other side and it turned out she had a urinary infection and her claim is that that's where she was going. But my mother, like I said, smart, pretty, very convincing. So either way, they had to postpone the trial because I guess if you're in a 72-hour hold, you can't go to court, which is messed up. So three months later, my father works up the balls, which he hasn't had in 42, 20 something years. And he and my aunt, uh, they go to trial. They have a very pricey lawyer. My mother has a public defender. Everyone testifies. My mother, you know, spews hateful stuff at my father and her sister, because frankly, even sober, my mom's got issues. And uh, the public defender stands up, you know, for his rebuttal, whatever it's called. And by the way, my husband's also a lawyer, so I should know these terms. But um, and the public defender points out that the psychiatrist at the facility my mother was staying at never signed the paperwork. And so the entire case is dismissed. This was this is the consequence of untreated ADHD. Probably. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Let's get this fucking judge on meds. Right. So it was almost to the day that my mother got out and that this last child, this 15 year old committed suicide. And I was distraught. And all of a sudden, um, I mean, I've been picking up suicidal teens here and there because it's a contagious thing. And all of a sudden, I realized that this, you know, 10 Steps to Finding Happy book we had coming out um, had enough of a backing to do something greater. My co-author wasn't thrilled with this, but um, I began to reach out to people and we had an event planned for Wednesday the 18th, which got canceled, but will be rescheduled because... I have gotten an amazing amount of celebrity support and, you know, autographs, um, merchandise. Uh, I've gotten food donated. I've gotten beverages donated. The venue, which is the Air and Space Museum in Long Island, was donated all from people in this community who want to help raise awareness and prevent teen suicide. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to get everyone to use the hashtag, hashtag, 10 steps and the stigma because all too often well-meaning parents come in with suicidal teens and tell these teens just don't tell the school or your friends or grandma. And so now we've got shame because we've got a secret. And if the kids break that silence, then we've got guilt. And at the very least, we're encouraging isolation from people who could support them. I grew up with that secret shame, you know, secret shame, guilt, and isolation. And I'm not doing that anymore, which is why I go on podcasts and talk about this openly. And yes, someday my parents will find out and probably uh, 
lose their shit, but I don't care because they had their chance to fix it. Mm. And I couldn't fix her. And so now I'm trying to fix someone else, just one person. So on, on March 20th, and don't worry, I'm going to bother you with a postcard and a hashtag. Um, I'm hoping we can spread this like social media wave swamp spirit. I got nothing because I'm not cool enough, but where, you know, we have this hashtag and this picture um, and someone, some kid goes on and sees their favorite influencer, their favorite celebrity, their, their neighbor, someone trying to help them and to show them that they are not alone. And in fact, I have autographs from um, Howard Stern, uh, Governor Cuomo, former Governor Cuomo. I don't know. Um, it's a podcast, uh, so at some point that will be accurate if it's not right now. Fair. Marsha Clark. Uh, I'm going to totally pretend that I know who that is. Oh, Jesus Christ, you're young. Yeah, okay. You, Michael you, Buble. You, you, I know who that is. You never want to have me on your team when it comes to like anything like pop culture celebrity like trivia. She was the judge in OJ Simpson's case or a lawyer. I do not know which one. I know, the point I, is, I know who OJ Simpson is. That's about it. <laughs> for those of you that can't see i'm banging my head on the microphone uh i was a, i was in high school i remember like we would like disc, i don't care we would I this class and I'm, like watch like the court uh case yeah. Was, yeah the point is very cool people have donated their signature <laughs> and have used the hashtag um in an attempt to help spread awareness and i'm bummed that this big event got postponed but it will happen another day and um, although my heart was in the event, my heart was in the event to make a difference. And yes, I cried a bunch, but, um, it's really now I, now I'm looking at it as I have two chances to make a difference. One on March 20th via social media, which is really what most of these kids are on anyway. And the other is when we do the event and they see this wall of famous people who, um, you know, who support them and who, you know, believe it will get better. And in therapy, we like to say that you may not hope have hope now, but I will carry that hope for you. And that is Mm. the purpose of this event and of the work that I'm doing desperately, treading water, sometimes drowning. So I have to ask you, uh, first of all, it's, it's, um, you're doing some really, really important work. So, um, hopefully, thank you. But what I always say is hopefully only if it works, how are you coping? Like, how do you, how do you engage in self-care? Cause you're dealing with some really heavy stuff. Yeah. Um, podcasting, honestly, though, talking about this is freeing that demon that I held inside me for so long. Mm. Um, I have a friend who's been, one of my closest friends since we were in fourth grade. And it was only two years ago that she saw my mom in full action and told me, I always thought you were being dramatic. And I, well, I didn't stab her. So that was good. But I finally realized that this sense of isolation and silence and shame wasn't in my head. It was true. You know, everything was minimized. Um, Yes, I have spent many years in and out of therapy. As part of my postdoc, I had to do 500 hours of four times a week therapy where you Did you like psychoanalysis? Yeah, that was it. That's what my postdoc is. Wow. Um, But but I also am, I think I'm coping by the, by finally having something I can do. You know, every time I send out a letter, uh, every time I get an autograph in the mail, every time something works out in my favor, I feel like I'm one step closer to making a difference. And the weird thing is going to be when my parents show up for this event and how they react. And dear God, I wish we had a video camera on for that one. Man, I would, I would give to be a fly on the wall there. Right. Or you could come, but I'm just saying, you know. I don't know when it is. So you can't say your business. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can say I'm far away. Um, wow. Um, 
you know, a few weeks ago, we had uh, Dr. Roberto Olivardia on uh, talking about uh, suicide and ADHD. Um, and that one of the things he talked about is the importance of opening conversation around uh, around suicide and not having it be uh, this sort of hush hush um, uh, topic and how important it is just normalize the, the you know, the, the topic itself. Um, well, it's to normalize the thoughts and feelings. Right, right. Um, yeah, cause you know, it's, it's, there's still, I mean, there's still so much stigma around mental illness in general. It is, we, I think we've come a long way from where we were, but we still have so, you know, when there is, when there are pockets of people who still are afraid to ask for help, then we still have a long way to go. Well, a couple of things. One is we minorities are still falling short. That's both men, religion, and race. And two is, have we, do we think that we've come a long way because we're using different words? Because I, to me, I, I, uh, I'm a big fan of saying whatever words come to mind. Uh, I mean, uh, listen, certain derogatory, you know, race and religion and ethnicity, not so much, but I re- I've received some some pushback um, from two groups. One is somehow the head of the Long Island, the American Society for Prevention of Suicide, Long Island chapter reached out to me to let me know that those of us in the mental health field slash prevent suicide field do not use the word stigma because it conjures up certain images. Uh, she is not a mental health professional. She does not work with suicidal people. She is a well-meaning person who I'm sure comes from a good place. But if that's all you got out of my message, you missed something. What word did they want you to use instead? I don't know. I didn't even bother asking. I just sort of whatever. But I'm meeting for her for lunch in April, unless she hears all the shit I've been talking about her. And we will discuss it then. I also heard from a mother whose child committed suicide, and she's very unhappy with me for using the term committed suicide, because it makes it sound criminal. Actually, suicide is considered criminal in some states. I'm not supporting that. But I am saying that that just because that's one association or connotation with the term committed. I'm going to say die by suicide or is that? Yeah, probably. And, and I, to which I told this woman, I have my own background in this and I understand yours, but um, I can't, when my mom eventually does succeed, I can't absolve her of the blame. And, and I understand why if it were my child, perhaps I would feel that way. I don't think so because that's not my, that's not my main focus. But I, I did tell her and I sincerely mean it that I will think about it. And we ended up having a very good conversation about, um, you know, the, that I, I was, I was not aware of this and I don't know if I agree with it, but I certainly I'm sorry for her pain and I'm sorry if my words hurt her and perhaps there'll become a time when I change my vocabulary, but I'm just not there yet from a personal yeah. developmental level, you know? I think that's a, that's really valuable to just share that because you're, you know, it's a way that you're sharing both how you personally come to this as well as professionally, you know, and, and, yeah. you know, people say, well, you know, take the professional hat off. It's like, you know, these hats are attached to us. Um, which, so the whole like separating profession from person. Right. I mean, it's, that we all walking around with like, like dissociative identity disorder that we can just right. like, sw- like swap identities when it's convenient for somebody else. Right. I mean, listen, I, I do think that um, in a marriage, two shrinks should not be analyzing each other, <laughs> but understanding each other. That would be but, a great yeah. sitcom. That's my husband and I. I we know. went to grad school together, yeah. and trust me, it was awful. <laughs> to do a podcast together. No, he doesn't know what a podcast is. He thinks a TED Talk is a podcast. And he's not allowed to listen to any of mine because I talk about us, and he's very private. Wow. That's, yeah, that's, de- that's deception bold. is everything in a marriage. <laughs> <laughs> Um, is that one of your, uh, your, um, 10 steps to happiness to happy? No, but I, can I tell you my favorite 10 step? Please. Cause I know we've gone beyond your time, yes. but, um, I'm sorry, but, um, this fits in. So 
my favorite 10 step is actually find your passion and find your purpose. And I bet it's easy for you to understand why. Um, I thought my passion was writing, which it is. I thought my passion, um, I, I love my children, but I would never have defined that as my passion because I was so conflicted and confused about what the fuck to do with these things. Cause you know, I didn't have a great role model and I didn't babysit a lot. Um, probably cause I didn't have a great role model, but, um, this, what I'm doing right now, this is my passion. This may be my purpose. Um, you know, I hope it's my purpose. And if it's not my purpose, then there's gotta be something else out there for me. But I just feel like I, I, I was so crushed. You can hear it in my voice. I was so crushed this morning when I had to decide to, you know, to change the, um, to put off the, the event date. And in fact, I still have been breaking it to people slowly, but, um, but I have not gotten tired of typing up letters again and again and again. My new best friends are the guys in the post office because I'm in there every day and it's, it all comes out of my pocket. There's, this is a self-published book. There's nothing paid for. I'm going to end up so broke that when my husband sees the bills, he's going to kill me. But it feels so good to be trying to make a difference for someone. Um, well, I hope that um, we can help uh, pay some of those bills for you by uh, having some of our listeners get that book. Um, that would be amazing. Yeah, I didn't Dr. even think Dr. Lindsay that. Weisner, um, where can people find your book and more information about you? So you can follow me on Instagram at Psych Shrink Mom. I am also at Neurotic Nourishment, also on Instagram. Why do you laugh every time? Those are great time? names. They're great names. I just love it. Thanks. Yeah. I came up with them out of nowhere. Um, we're not well thought out at all. Um, you can find out more about the book. There, We also have a st- 10 Steps Finding Happy on Instagram and a uh, 10 Steps Finding Happy on Facebook. Um, the book is currently for pre sale on Amazon, but that being said, I don't, I don't think, I think it will be available full sale by the time this airs. Yes, probably. Um, and is it going to be on Audible? Sh- uh, I need to find a way to do that. So what we might do is because we have to push this back, what we might do is release the Audible book, um, at the event, it's very complicated to, uh, you know, who wants to listen to my voice? And we also have 24 expert writers. They're not going to all record things. So thanks for making me feel inadequate. Much appreciated. Um, but for now, you can do it old school and buy the actual book. And there's also going to be an ebook up quite shortly. So Awesome. Well, thank you so much for uh, for sharing what you have here on the podcast and for your time and for uh, doing things that will hopefully be making a big difference fingers crossed and toes if i could do that but i can't thank you for having me thank you so much uh her book is 10 steps to finding happy you can find it on amazon probably by the time this comes out and uh maybe in a bookstore if it goes really well on amazon um it's supposed to be in some barnes and nobles bookstores so if you can find a barnes and nobles bookstore good luck awesome um but uh i will also send you the link because i know you want it for your show notes Thank you. We will put in the show notes, which will be at ADHDrewired.com slash whatever podcast number this is. Just put that number after the slash. Very complicated, but I'm sure they can handle it. <laughs> Thank you so much. And we will uh, we'll catch you next time. Thank you. This is Eric Tivers. Thank you for listening and congratulations for making it to the end. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. The website is ADHDrewired.com. You can find summaries and additional resources for each episode. You can apply to our free and secret Facebook community. You can learn more about ADHD Rewired's intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups and sign up for my email newsletter to get exclusive content you won't get anywhere else. It's all at ADHDrewired.com. While you're there, click the Patreon button. If you're a regular listener and you're still listening to my voice, 
consider making a monthly contribution by becoming a patron through our Patreon page. If you are able to financially support my work, it would mean a lot. This show is free to listeners, but it is not free to produce. And patrons get really cool perks. You can follow me on Twitter at Eric Tibbers. You can like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash ADHD Rewired. If you're a coach, therapist, or related professional, connect with me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash Eric Tibbers. You can also subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube. And you can subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube and see select interviews and some other videos I've posted. Podcasts change lives. You can make a difference in someone's life by spreading the word about this podcast. Mention it in your online communities on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, or wherever you hang out online. And be sure to share it with your friends and your family and your clients, as well as your coaches, therapists, and doctors. And if you're a coach, therapist, doctor, or ADHD support group leader, and you would like a pack of podcast postcards to hand out, you can request those at my website, ADHDrewired.com. And if you're a member of Chad or any other ADHD support group, please be sure to tell them about this podcast. You can even show them how to download it on their phone. You know, you might be the person that turns somebody on to a podcast for the very first time. And if you really love this episode, please consider hitting share on your podcast player. I'm only one person and I count on you to help me spread the message. One of the biggest things that you can do to support this podcast and to help other people discover it is to leave an honest rating and review on Apple Podcasts, on Stitcher, or any other podcast app that accepts ratings and reviews. And don't forget to hit subscribe on this podcast on your podcast app so new episodes are automatically pushed to your favorite podcast app. Looking for more ways to listen and learn? Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Not sure where to start? In no particular order. Check out Atomic Habits by James Clear, The Body Keeps Score by Bessel van der Kolk, 10% Happier, and Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics. These are both by Dan Harris. Change Your Questions and Change Your Life by Marilee G. Adams. The One Thing by Gary Keller and Jay Papasan. Procrastinate on Purpose by Rory Vaden. The Four Tendencies by Gretchen Rubin. Do you have trouble asking for help? Listen to The Art of Asking by Amanda Palmer. It's one of the best produced audiobooks I've ever heard. If you're looking for something a little bit more, say, magical, I unexpectedly fell in love with the Harry Potter series. And I don't usually listen to those kinds of books. And I loved it. And of course, if you haven't yet boarded the Brene Brown bus yet, check out Brene Brown's books, starting with The Gifts of Imperfection, Daring Greatly, Rising Strong, The Power of Vulnerability, and if you're an entrepreneur or a leader in any capacity, check out her 2018 book, Dare to Lead. And Brene still is my most wanted guest. So if you know Brene, you would be so kind to make that connection for me. I would be really, really grateful. You know who else I would like to have on the show? You. Click the podcast tab at ADHDrewired.com and then click the Be a Guest button at the top of that page and schedule a 15-minute pre interview. This is Eric Tibbers reminding you to keep learning, keep growing, and keep connecting. Self-care is not selfish, and no matter what gets done or doesn't get done, at the end of the day, you are still enough. And no matter how hard it feels, we can do hard things. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next week.